Carlos Yulbengian was an entrepreneur and a millionaire of Armenian origin, the largest oil magnate of the mid-20th century, and a philanthropist. He was born on March 23, 1869, in Constantinople. The Gulbangians were merchants and money changers, who were in constant, regular communication with partners in major Ottoman cities such as Izmir, Beirut, and Baghdad, and in lands which had formerly been Ottoman, such as Bulgaria and Egypt. They exported the empire's raw cotton, wool, mohair, and opium, and imported cloths from Manchester, glassware from France, and kerosene from Baku. Alongside the Armenian members in the family, the household also included Turks, Greeks, and maybe even one or two French. It was their job to do the laundry and cook the meals. The Gilbankians had only to clap their hands, and a fresh cup of coffee would appear right in front of them. Often, the servants would carry Galus to school and back on their shoulders. Kalos attended a local Armenian school, named Aramian Unjian. It was exactly at this school that Kalos made the first financial deal of his life. The seven-year-old student received a Turkish silver coin for excellent academic progress, earning his first, but definitely not last, financial profit. His family wanted to see how Kalos would spend his money, because they believe that spending money is an art in itself that not everyone is very talented at. So, to check their son, they sent him to the market to see what he'd buy. To everyone's surprise, Galos did not buy candies or toys, as many seven-year-old children would. Instead, he exchanged a silver coin for an old Armenian coin. This was very upsetting news for Galos's father, as he concluded that his son had a rather artistic, poetic soul, and therefore he would never get as rich as him and as the rest of their family who were known for their wealth and numerous donations to the community. Therefore, Galus' father, Sarkis Gulbengian, decided to instill a fearsome work ethic in Galust, teaching the young boy to enjoy hard work for its own sake, and not for parental or societal approval. At the age of 15, the family decided to send Galus to France to improve his French at a high school in Marseille. This was something very common in the Gilbengian family, who would send their young sons to foreign territories in quest of new experiences and acquisition of new languages. As a result of which, the family was known for its educated, polyglot, and mobile nature. Later in his life, Carlos Gilbengian managed to learn not only French, but seven other languages, proving himself a real Gilbengian. After completing his high school education in France, Gilbengian was admitted to King's College in London, where he studied engineering. When he was studying at King's College, his mother was urging him to study less, while his father, Sarkis Gilbengian, was demanding even higher grades. In his response letters, Galust was asking why in the Ottoman Empire they knew so little about geology, why did they not have a good idea of what minerals were? the interests and passions of the young Armenian were slowly being outlined. Kalust was a brilliant student, and in 1887 he graduated from university at the age of 18 with a first-class degree in petroleum engineering and applied sciences. After graduating from university, Gulbengian followed his father's advice and went to Baku to examine the Russian oil industry, and bring his theoretical knowledge of oil into practice. Within a year, Gilbankian fully mastered the skills and secrets of the oil business. He wrote an article describing his travels to Baku and the state of the oil industry in the region. The article was entitled La Transcaucasie et la Péninsule de l'Apcheron, Souvenir de Voyage, Transcaucasia and the Apcheron Peninsula, Memoirs of a Journey which appeared in a prominent French-language monthly magazine. But later, the article was eventually published as a standalone book, extremely valuable for research purposes in the general oil industry. In 1887, another prominent Armenian, Hagop Pasha, was appointed as the Ottoman Minister of Finance. After his appointment, he requested Galus to prepare an oil survey of Mesopotamia, modern Syria and Iraq. To develop the oil survey, 
Kalost read travel books and interviewed railroad engineers who were building the Baghdad Railway. Gulbenkian's oil survey led Hagop Pasha to believe that vast oil deposits lay in Mesopotamia, enabling him to acquire tracts of land for the Sultan's oil reserves and to establish the Ottoman oil industry. In 1896, Gulbenkian and his family had to flee the Ottoman Empire due to the Hamidian massacres of Armenians. They ended up in Egypt, where Alexander Mantashians, a wealthy and renowned Armenian oil magnate and philanthropist, introduced Gulbenkian to influential contacts in Cairo. Still in his 20s, Gulbenkian moved to London in 1897, where, thanks to his substantial knowledge and wide-ranging contacts, he managed to arrange top-level deals in the oil business. In 1907, the English Shell was still only a transportation company and had just made the decision to start an oil business. They were trying to buy the Dutch oil company Royal Dutch, and Galos Gulbenkian took on the role of mediator. Fully justifying his reputation as a talented negotiator, Gulbenkian managed the deal, becoming a shareholder himself. His policy of retaining 5% of the shares of the oil companies he developed earned him the nickname Mr. 5%. And this is how, through Gilbenkian's mediation, the Royal Dutch Shell appeared in the world. Today, Royal Dutch Shell is the largest company in Europe with an annual turnover of half a trillion dollars. After the Royalist counter-coup of 1909, Gilbenkian became a financial and economic advisor to the Turkish embassies in London and Paris, and later, chief financial advisor to the Turkish government and a director of the National Bank of Turkey. In 1912, Gulbenkian was the driving force behind the creation of the Turkish Petroleum Company, TPC, a consortium of the largest European oil companies aimed at cooperatively obtaining oil exploration and development rights in the Ottoman territory of Mesopotamia. The German interests would be limited to a 25% share with a 35% share for the British and the remaining for Gulbenkian to choose. So he gave Royal Dutch Shell 25% and kept 15% for himself as the conceiver, the founder and the artisan of the Turkish Petroleum Combine. At first, the British Foreign Office supported the group of William Knox Darcy, the founder of British Petroleum, to gain a share and replace Galust's share. However, Gulbenkian worked closely with French concerns, arranged for the French to receive the Germans' share as part of the spoils of victory, and in return, the French protected his interest. During the dismantling of the Ottoman Empire after the war, most of Ottoman Syria came under the French mandate for Syria and Lebanon, and most of Ottoman Iraq came under British mandate. Heated and prolonged negotiations ensued regarding which companies could invest in the Turkish Petroleum Company. The TPC was granted exclusive oil exploration rights to Mesopotamia in 1925. The discovery of a large oil reserve in northern Iraq provided the impetus to conclude negotiations. But when it came to defining the Ottoman Empire in Asia, as it had been in 1914, the oilmen who found themselves in Ostend that day in 1928 were confused and unsure about what to do, until Carlos Gilbengian intervened. He called for a large map of the Middle East, took a thick red pencil, and slowly drew a red line around the central area. This was the Ottoman Empire which I knew in 1914, he said. And I ought to know, I was born in it, lived in it and served it. If anybody knows better, carry on. Gulbenkian's TPC partners inspected the map and it was good. This account, taken from Ralph Harwin's 1957 biography, continues. Gulbenkian had built a framework for Middle East oil development which lasted until 1948. Another fantastic one-man feat, unsurpassed international big business. This San Remo oil agreement came to be known as the Red Line Agreement, and it served to determine which oil companies could invest in TPC and reserved 5% of the shares for Gulbenkian. 
The name of the company was changed to the Iraq Petroleum Company in 1929. The Pasha had actually given Gulbenkian the entire Iraqi oil concession. Gulbenkian, however, saw advantage in divesting the vast majority of his concession so that corporations would be able to develop the whole. Gulbenkian grew wealthy on the remainder. He reputedly said, Better a small piece of a big pie than a big piece of a small one. As a secretive man without loyalties to any one empire, state or company, Gulbenkian could present himself as the ultimate honest broker. For Westerners, he was a trusted source of intelligence on the Middle East. For Easterners, he was someone to turn to in order to find out what the great powers and their mighty oil companies were up to. No other business figure in the history of the oil industry wielded such influence over such a scale for so long. Inspired by his experience in the oil world, Gulbenkian observed, Oil men are like cats. One never knows when listening to them whether they are fighting or making love. Speaking of love, Gulbenkian's marriage too was a very profitable deal. In 1892, at the age of 23, Gulbenkian got married to Navart Yesayan, the daughter of Armenian wealthy entrepreneur Hovanas Yesayan. Gulbenkian had immense love for women, and he said they helped him maintain a healthy rhythm of life. But he still managed to stay in marriage with Navart for 60 years and have two children, a son Nubar and a daughter Rita, who would become the wife of prominent Iranian diplomat of Armenian descent Gevork Doris Yesayan. Carlos Gulbenkian was a man of not only great wealth, but also great art. He revealed his passion for art at an early age. This reflected his origins of Cappadocia, a major crossroads of religions and art, and Constantinople, another crossroads of civilizations and the capital of the Romans, Greeks, and Ottoman Turks. Throughout his life, he assembled an eclectic and unique collection that was influenced by his travels and his personal taste, and sometimes involved lengthy and complex negotiations with the leading experts and specialist dealers. Most of these were his own purchases, while some others were gifts. For example, one study sought Gulbenkian's advice and Gulbenkian helped him, as a response to which Stalin rewarded him with Rembrandts from the famous Hermitage Museum. In the late 1920s, early 1930s, the Soviet government urgently needed foreign currency to finance the rapid industrialization of Russia ordered in the first five-year plan. The government had already sold off collections of jewelry, furniture, and icons seized from the Russian nobility, wealthy classes, and the church so the only other thing left to sell were the Hermitage paintings. This phase came to be known as the Soviet sale of Hermitage paintings, during which Gulbenkian managed to purchase tremendous amounts of astonishing art pieces at ridiculously cheap prices. His collection now totals over 6,000 pieces from all over the world and dating from antiquity until the early 20th century, including examples from ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, Babylonia, Armenia, Persia, Islamic art, Europe, and Japan. His attachment to the pieces that he acquired was so strong that he even called them his children. The collection grew over the years. The Paris collection was divided for security reasons, and part was sent to London. In 1936, the collection of Egyptian art was entrusted to the care of the British Museum, while the finest paintings, went to the National Gallery. Later in 1948 and 1950, the same works would be sent on to the National Gallery of Art in Washington. As his collection grew, Gulbenkian grew more concerned about how to preserve his achievement, but also how to avoid paying taxes on his legacy. In 1937, he started having discussions with his advisor Knef Clerk about founding a Gulbenkian Institute at the National Gallery in London. However, he was declared an enemy under the act by the British government during the Second World War, because he had followed the French government to Vichy as a member of the Persian diplomatic delegation. The British temporarily confiscated his share of the oil from the Iraq Petroleum Company. 
Although this was a technical legal decision and after the war the concession was returned to him with compensation, this action of his adopted country irritated him, as he suspected that his partners were using the British government to squeeze him out of the partnership. Consequently, he then considered the National Gallery of Art in Washington as a potential home for his collection, and in 1943, his British lawyer became his chief discussion partner and confidant. Interestingly, an important part of Yulbengian's collection are coins from different time periods and geographic locations. Seems like a logical continuation of Yulbengian's first ever financial deal when he was seven years old. Throughout his life, Gilbengian donated large sums of money to churches, scholarships, schools, and hospitals. Many of his donations were to Armenian foundations and establishments. He required that proceeds from his 5% share of profits from oil should go to Armenian families. He also demanded that 5% of his workers in his oil production for the Iraq Petroleum Company should be of Armenian descent. He established and built the St. Sarkis Armenian Church in central London as a memorial to his parents. From 1920 to 1940, he paid for the financial needs of Armenian schools and medical centers of Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq. He built and rebuilt churches as he wanted to provide spiritual comfort to the Armenian community and a place of gathering for dispersed Armenians. In 1929, he was the chief benefactor to the establishment of an extensive library at the St. James Cathedral, the principal church of the Armenian Patriarchate of Jerusalem. The library is called the Gubengian Library and contains more than 100,000 books. He also helped establish a nurse's home at the hospital after selling his wife's jewelry. However, Gubengian preferred not to talk about his charities. When the Ejmiatin Cathedral in Armenia was at the edge of destruction, the Catholicos asked the financial assistance of Armenian philanthropists living in diaspora. One person assisted the renovation of the cathedral by sending $400,000, which was a huge sum of money at that time. The person had asked not to reveal his name, and only after the renovation was completed, it became known that Galos Gulbengian was the person behind the charity. Carlos did not like being photographed, but one instance was an exception. During one of his travels, Gilbengian came across children playing on the street. These were children born into the camps established on the outskirts of Beirut, in the wake of Armenian genocide. Gilbengian stopped and started chatting with the children, and he asked to be photographed with them. In his travel diary caption accompanying the photograph, there was a short note, Vu se, where in the letter C, most likely refers to the French word go, which means rascals. Voices in salt directed to the Turks who had massacred and displaced Armenians, as a result of which these children were born and raised in such poor and unhealthy conditions. This will remain a mystery, but one thing is certain. Gilbengian wanted to remember this encounter, perhaps to revisit this topic later through his philanthropic work, or to just simply remember that, for some, mobility is not a choice or an adventure, but necessity and escape. He left France in late 1942, moved to Lisbon, and lived there until his death. In his spare time, Gilbengian enjoyed spending time in nature, with his animals and birds. He had even constructed a village of miniature Norman castles for his birds, for the happiness of pheasants, swans, and ducks. This garden was located in Lisbon, and is currently known as the Gilbengian Park. As he wrote in a letter to his grandson Mikhail, to enjoy a kind of intimacy with nature is to possess a source of profound satisfaction in life. For the man with insight into her secrets, nature becomes a kind refuge. Gilbengian died in a suite at the luxurious Avis Hotel on 20th July 1955, at the age of 86. His ashes were buried at St. Sarkis Armenian Church in London, the church which he had built in honor of his parents. But even the topic of death was a matter of calculation for Mr. 5%. In 1948, he was visited by American businessmen with a business offer. Examining the business plan, at that moment the 78-year-old billionaire asked, 
how much money will I earn from this work in 28 years? The astonished Americans were, on the one hand, trying to count Gulbenkian's share, and on the other hand, his age 28 years later on. I have decided to live for 106 years, Carlos Gulbenkian continued. My father has lived for 105 years. I will surpass him for a year.